think we're going to get started as everybody is slowly trickling in. Um, I just want to say good afternoon and welcome to our One Talk program. I just thank you so much for joining us. We're so glad that you are able to participate in our webinar. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Katie Hawk, and I'm the Director of Marketing at Sansom Diabetes Research Institute. And I've been living with type 1 diabetes for, gosh, over 38 years, and I'm still learning how to manage diabetes from our incredible diabetes community. So thank you so much for being here and contributing. Uh, we all learn from one another, and it definitely takes a village. Uh, we understand that your time is valuable, and we truly appreciate your presence here. So during the webinar, I encourage you to actively participate and make the most out of this opportunity. Feel free to ask questions, share your insights, and interact with our speakers and fellow attendees in the chat box. Uh, if time permits, we'll have a Q&A session during the last um, a few minutes of the program. We want to make sure that we hit all of our important topics. So um, if we do have time, we will do that. But feel free to put your questions in the chat box and we'll try to address as many of them as we can. We're also recording this event and it's going to be posted on Sansom Diabetes Research Institute's uh, YouTube channel. And that link will be mailed out to everyone who registered for the event. So if you want to share it or if there are certain parts of it that you want to um, or you know, maybe didn't get to that we'll be able to, you'll be able to see the full program. Um, today we have an incredible lineup of speakers who are experts in their respective fields. They will be uh, diving deep into our webinar's theme, Omnipod 5 Care Strategies Along the Life Cycle. And we've carefully curated this event to, brought, to provide you with valuable information and actionable strategies that you can implement right away in your diabetes management. Um, so I'd like to get started and welcome Mei, Mei Church. Um, she is a nurse practitioner and certified diabetes care educational specialist at SDRI. Dr. Ashley Thorsell, she's a research physician and endocrinologist at SDRI. And Bethany Long, who is the medical affairs manager at Insulet Corporation. So thank you all for joining us today and let's get started. Thank you, Katie. Hi, everyone. Um, as Katie said, my name is Bethany Long, and I have the pleasure of moderating our session today. Um, I'm really excited for all the topics that we're going to dig into in more detail. Thank you, Mei, Mei and Dr. Thorsell for being here as well. Um, throughout the next 45 minutes, we're going to be discussing Omnipod 5 automated insulin delivery system care strategies along the life cycle by exploring acute and chronic changes that impact glycemia and diabetes management. Mamie and Dr. Thorsell, I'm looking forward to hearing your perspectives on how you strategize management of these various scenarios with patients utilizing um, automated insulin delivery systems and the Omnipod 5 system. Um, just as a quick note, the opinions expressed in this webinar are those, are those of the speakers that we have today um, and do not reflect the, the views or positions of insulin. So first, we're gonna discuss some acute situations that impact glycemia, starting with exercise and increased activity. Um, we know that exercise is really important to overall health and wellness with diabetes, um, but it can also be challenging to balance insulin doses and carb intake, um, all while managing your blood sugars and trying to do the activities that you like to do. Um, now, while using the Omnipod 5 system in automated mode, there is an option for modifying automated insulin delivery through the activity feature that, you know, if patients notice um, certain activities, they want to decrease their insulin that's automatically delivered um, because they tend to have hypoglycemia, they can use this feature. Um, and when it's enabled, automated insulin delivery is reduced and the target glucose is, is temporarily set to 150 milligrams per deciliter. So traditionally, we think of using activity feature for exercise, but I'm interested to hear from Maymay and Dr. Thorsell, what other activities outside of exercise um, might a patient think about using this for? So Maymay, I'll start with you. Sure. Yeah. Activity mode could also be useful when you're doing yard work, um, when you're doing manual labor with lots of lifting and moving around for kids during recess or running around outdoors. 
And for those who tend to run low for hours after exercise or overnight, keeping activity mode on during that time could also be helpful. Another scenario could be if you over bolus or didn't finish your food and already gave insulin up front, activity mode could help lower your risk for hypoglycemia. Great. That's a, that's a great point, especially about the overnight as well. You know, we think about in the moment lows with activity, but I think we forget that sometimes hours later it can impact your blood sugars too. Um, you can also set activity feature with Omnipod 5 for up to 24 hours as well. Um, so you can choose the amount of time, but the max is um, for 24 hours. So what about you, Dr. Thorsell? Yeah, so I, I also agree all of those are great scenarios, um, you know, especially to emphasize like people might have the benefits of exercise and the risks of hypoglycemia for up to 24 hours. So that a lot of people forget to do that, the, the, you know, the night after they exercise, especially if it's more intense than they're used to. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to what May May described, you know, a lot of things that people don't think of as being exercise could just be you know, sweeping, mopping, walking around, cleaning your house, um, climbing stairs. Um, I have some patients who, you know, are nannies or babysitters, and they're concerned about having lows because they're running after a toddler. And that, you know, could be, you know, unexpected exercise. Um, they don't want that risk of hypoglycemia when they're taking care of a baby. Uh, also, some nurses or, um, you know, restaurant staff, retail um, workers that they're working a work shift and they, you know, they, they plan to be doing a lot of walking during their shift. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, some patients may need to prolong the exercise mode several hours or even overnight, um, especially if they're more sensitive after exercise um, or if they're, you know, marathon runners, or if they did an Ironman race, triathlons, where prolonged periods of exercise have used up some of their glycogen stores. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've also heard of patients using it with grocery shopping, you know, you're walking up and down the aisles, or if you're doing really some, some intense outlet mall shopping, yeah. um, or even travel, you know, sometimes yeah. you land and you're walking all the way to baggage claim and, you know, you're not really sure how far you're going to have to walk. And sometimes yeah. it's quite the trek depending on what airport you're in. So even thinking about using it for that um, may be useful. So Great. Um, so another question that I've heard a lot is, you know, what kind of guidance um, do you give patients on the timing of when to start it and when to stop it in relation to when they're going to be exercising or doing that particular feature? So uh, Mamie, I'll start with you. If you can kind of provide, you know, in general, what do you kind of speak with your patients about? Yeah, so this is a really tricky topic because there's no standard answer. Everyone is different. Mm -hmm. And even for the same person, it could be different from one day to the next. So there are many factors to take into account. It depends <clears throat> on your glucose level at the time, the amount of insulin on board, how fast your glucose decreases during that particular activity, and also past experience. So if exercise is going to be strenuous where you know your glucose level is going to drop rapidly, I would recommend starting activity mode 30 to 60 minutes before exercise. If your starting glucose is under 150, I would consider taking some fast acting carbs prior to exercise. And then if your glucose level is above 150 with little or no insulin on board and the exercise is going to be mild, you could start activity mode when starting exercise or you might find that you may not need activity mode at all. Mm -hmm. If your glucose is above 250 and ketones are positive, you should give a correction and avoid exercise until ketones are negative. That's really helpful and, and simple too. I think we don't always, we, we think what's the strategy that I can use every single time that's going to work. But the reality is, especially with automated insulin delivery, the delivery is dynamic and insulin on board is changing all the time. So you have to keep that in mind um, in addition to what your glucose is in terms of when to start activity feature and maybe even how long to run it for. So those are all really great considerations. Um, Dr. Thorsall, I'll turn it to you now. What are some of your recommendations? 
Yeah, like like Bami said, the guidelines regarding glucose, insulin management during exercise and the type of exercise is all support, all support a, a very individualized approach. And it's not one size fits all. And even from day to day for the same person, it could be different. And so many factors need to be taken into consideration. The, the baseline fitness level of the patient, you know, if you're not used to exercising, but you start an exercise regime, you, you might have a lot of more insulin sensitivity than someone who is you know, regularly doing this and their body is kind of accustomed to that type of exercise. Um, also, the, the type of exercise that's performed is very important, aerobic or cardiovascular exercise versus resistance training, which is anaerobic. Um, oftentimes, you know, you, you may not need to have or utilize activity feature during, you know, resistance mode or resistance exercise. Um, it also depends on the intensity. It depends on the duration of exercise, their prior experience, and how much their glucose declines during exercise, amount of insulin on board, timing from the last meal. So lots of different factors. Um, and usually an approach utilizing basal rate reductions, activity mode, um, pre-meal bolus reductions, and usually also fast acting glucose are, are necessary to prevent the exercise induced hypoglycemia and often the post exercise hypoglycemia. So, and just to support, you know, research does show that glucose levels tend to decline less during resistance exercise. So that's one scenario where you may not need to do any activity feature um, and you may not even need to take extra, extra carbs. But generally for any, you know, moderate intensity aerobic activity, like, you know, fast walking, running, cycling, swimming. Um, usually if it's longer than 30 minutes, I do recommend utilizing the activity mode. And if it's planned exercise, preferably to start, you know, 30 minutes or even up to 90 minutes prior to the activity. Um, if, if you plan exercise around the, around the time of a meal or within two hours after a meal, I usually recommend some degree of pre-meal bolus reduction, depending on what type of exercise you're doing. So typically I'll recommend taking only half of the bolus if you're going to exercise within 30 minutes of that meal. Um, but there was a great position statement that was published back in 2020. There's excellent guidelines that do detail basal rate reductions, pre-exercise bolus reductions. And, and, but again, these are all individualized and you know it, it's really trial and error um, depending mm -hmm. on the person and the type of exercise you do. So yes, there is some guidelines, but it doesn't always work. <laughs> yeah. So if at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. again. <laughs> try a different strategy. There, there are ways to make it work. And um, you know, working with your healthcare provider, you can strategize together. And you know, hopefully some of these little tidbits can help. Um, thank you. Okay, so now we're going to move to talking about another hot topic that. I usually hear a lot of questions about is um, managing high fat or high protein meals. Um, so, and especially now that we have automated insulin delivery systems, um, there was an AID consensus paper that was published um, September of last year that discusses that, you know, while some systems have the ability to give an extended bolus, the clinical utility of this is limited in most automated insulin delivery systems, um, and, and some, you know, an extended bolus is not available in automated mode like Omnipod 5. And this is really because of the way that the algorithm is modulating insulin delivery um, because, you know, the patient gives a bolus and the system is looking into the future at what their glucose level is predicted to be. And then it's changing that background um, insulin delivery accordingly and can increase insulin delivery um, if it sees that the user is predicted to be high. Um, so it's an interesting discussion. Um, Maymay, May, what do you think are some of the clinical advantages of using an AID system with high fat or high protein meals? Yeah, Bethany, I think that you've touched on the most important things about the current AID technology right now. So the, all the current AID systems are able to predict the CGM value ahead of time and therefore will adjust the insulin delivery accordingly. So in the case of high fat or high protein meals, it can predict the glucose rise that's gonna happen and increase the amount of insulin infused. 
So this can decrease the level of hyperglycemia reached as well as the duration of the high blood, hyper, high blood sugar. So, but it is still important for the user to pre-bolus around 15 minutes before eating to decrease the amount of hyperglycemia after the meal. Great, so, so kind of in your experience, like you'll have patients, you know, still pre-bolus for that meal before you're gonna eat, even with it being a high fat, high protein meal, because in several hours from now, you know, when you were using a standard pump, you were kind of in charge of, oh, I see the rise, I might need to, correct or give more, but you may see that depending on the food that you eat and what your blood sugars are doing, that that automated insulin delivery kind of takes care of that postprandial rise that you see later on. Um, but, you know, you also still have the ability to give a correction if needed, you know, if, it, if it's still a little bit higher. Um, great. Dr. Thorsell, how do you kind of manage the, the discussion of bolus timing with high fat or high protein meals? Um, that's the first part. And then I'll also, I'm curious if it's different with patients that have gastroparesis. Yeah. So like you said, very hot topic. It's a common question I get from patients and something that I, as a you know patient with type one diabetes experience often, it's, it's really tough. Um, these high fat, high protein meals, typically they, they require kind of a multiphasic pattern of bolusing insulin, which the automated insulin delivery systems don't take into consideration. Um, and in order to match that kind of physiologic insulin response, um, usually, you know, two to four hours after a meal, um, you know, an additional insulin bolus might be necessary or a combination bolus at the beginning and then two to three hours after might be necessary because fat, the way that it affects your body is it delays gastric emptying in the, the two hours following a meal. And it leads to like late postprandial hyperglycemia. And that's mainly due to the free fatty acid induced insulin resistance. Um, protein also has a similar effect, um, but it has differential effects depending on whether it's consumed with or without carbohydrates. But again, similarly, protein also affects glucose in the late postprandial period, two to four hours after a meal. And so this is often um, the case for like holiday meals that consist of, you know, large servings of like ham, prime rib, turkey with, you know, mashed, mashed potatoes, gravy, or eating at a buffet, um, even eating Chinese food. And so oftentimes I will recommend giving the bolus, giving 50% of the bolus actually initially, um, because with that extra fat and protein kind of delaying the absorption of the carbohydrates, your blood sugars might drop too much if you give the full bolus right at, right at the beginning. But if you give 50% at the start of the meal and then kind of divide that and give 50% two to three hours later, or you know, by looking at your continuous glucose monitor when that postprandial hyperglycemia starts, then you can kind of give that additional bolus. Um, but you know, an, another example um, is with ketogenic diets. So this is a high fat, high protein meal, um, but it's very low in carbohydrates. And so it often can be very helpful for, for patients with type one diabetes to follow a ketogenic diet for a number of different reasons. But um, because they're low in carbohydrates, a lot of patients don't want to give any insulin for that meal. Um, you know, they're hesitant to give any insulin for the lack of carbohydrates, but because of that extra fatty acid induced insulin resistance that you get with this high fat meal, it often necessitates even a small bolus um, if you eat a large enough amount. Um, in, in the case of gastroparesis, again, that's also challenging and can be mitigated by different types of insulin, but specifically with automated insulin delivery systems, what I'll have them do is really based on their experience, but I'll have them bolus after the meal is completed um, and utilizing their sensor glucose, the rate of change on their sensor glucose um, to identify the exact timing of when to give that bolus. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have patients um, you know, that have lows with that strategy of giving it after since, you know, if you give it after it might see the rise in their blood sugar. So it might increase automated insulin delivery initially, and then they give a bolus for it, or does it kind of usually level out just because of the gastroparesis? It usually levels out. I, I tend to see it less often with the automated insulin delivery systems, but more often with, you know, just the 
unclosed loop the open loop, um, systems when, when they're giving their bolus ahead of time. But I do feel that the algorithm can kind of compensate for that risk of hypoglycemia by shutting off um, early on. Um, but yeah, it's different for everyone. Great. So, so yeah, to summarize, it seems like there's a couple of different strategies, just like with exercise, like with high fat meals, you could, you know, try the strategy of giving the bolus before them, you know, and not the case of gastroparesis, you could give the bolus before the meal and then keep an eye on your blood sugars two to three hours or even four hours later, you know, see what your CGM is doing, you know, see if the algorithm is adjusting accordingly. Um, if you do need a correction, maybe you need to give a correction then, or you could try the strategy of, you know, you've tried that, you go low, maybe you do 50% of it up front, and then two to three hours later, give the other 50%. Um, do you ever have patients that need to give the full amount and then, you know, a little bit more midway, like not do the 50% up front? Yeah. And yeah, some patients do require, you know, even like a 10 to 20% increase on top of that, just because of the fat and the protein in it, not even accounting for the amount of carbs in that meal. And it really, you know, every person with type one diabetes is different. They have different levels of insulin resistance, depending on their weight. And um, again, it, it really is a, a trial and error um, type of strategy, but at least we have kind of like a blueprint to go by to strategize, you know, what, what may work and you can see if it works for you, but experience is really going to be the best telltale sign. So go out and have your favorite meals over and over <laughs> to try all these exactly. out. Um, okay. So let's see. Um, moving to I'm going to move to the topic of menstruation. So this is another um, hot topic that we get questions about, um, you know, in addition to the many factors that can affect glucose levels on a daily basis, we know that menstrual cycles can make managing glycemia even more extra challenging um, during that time of the month. So what are some of the short-term glycemic impacts that you see patients encounter related to menstruation? Uh, May May, I'll start with you. So some people, and I mean, this doesn't happen to everyone, but some people could see a rise or a fall in their glucose levels around the start of their menstruation. And for some people, it could actually start a few days before menstruation begins. Okay, and then Dr. Thorsell. Yeah, again, you know, the effect of menstrual cycle changes on glucose control, insulin sensitivity, it's really not consistent. Um, and so, again, this is very individualized, but, you know, many patients with type 1 diabetes, they tend to have hyperglycemia and insulin resistance in like the second half of their menstrual cycle, just prior to their the start of their menses. And that's because of the increases in the progesterone hormone, which is associated with insulin resistance. And then, as soon as their periods begin, um, they find they require significantly less insulin, both basal and bolus, because they're more insulin sensitive. And that's in relationship to the levels of estrogen. So again, everyone is different and working with your healthcare provider and patterns that you've you know, tracked along the way can help to identify um, whether or not you need to, to make any additional changes to mitigate hypo or hyperglycemia. Mm -hmm. That's a great point about just even within the menstrual cycle, like progesterone affects it differently. You know, that makes you more resistant. And then the estrogen that can make you, um, did you say more insulin sensitive, more yeah. sensitive? Yeah. Within, you know, and you're looking at a period of a week and a half or two weeks, mm -hmm. you know, when you factor in like the time before and then the time during um, and it can be a frustrating time every month to go, you know, to experience that. So how do you work with your patients? Um, May I'll start with you. How do you work with your patients on diabetes management during this time? And um, what are some of the clinical advantages of using an AID system during these fluctuations? Well, so all the current AID systems will adjust the insulin delivery according to glucose predictions. And so during menstruation, if the patient's glucose is higher than usual, more basal insulin will be delivered. 
And some AID pumps can also deliver automated insulin corrections as needed. And for those using AID pumps that allow for different basal rate settings, a menstrual basal rate setting um, could be used during this time, whether it's higher basal rate for people who tend to be hyperglycemic or maybe a lower basal rate for when they tend to be hypoglycemic. Mm -hmm. And then um, anything with like your bolus settings that you try to strategize with? Um, yeah, so the bolus settings, so you could, if you are more insulin resistant, for example, you could lower your insulin sensitivity factor or your correction factor. So you get more insulin with your corrections. Um, you might do the same thing for your carb ratios as well. Um, you could also decrease your active insulin time. So all those things will give you more insulin um, if you're more insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like, you know, first is just understanding your body and your patterns and tracking and kind of evaluating what the patterns that you're seeing are and then kind of strategizing from there, you know, right. what's the best use. Okay. Uh, Dr. Thorsell, what about you? I think, you know, Mei Mei's picked on the, you know, the most important strategies and, and ways that you can adjust your um, insulin pump. The, the biggest thing is that, you know, although it's recognizing and adjusting your basal insulin delivery according to glucose predictions, total daily insulin from the prior pods, it, it doesn't take into consideration the insulin resistance that you might have during that time where you might need to intensify your carb ratios or intensify your correction factors which basically means lowering the number on your carb ratio or correction factors may be explained. But again, just tracking this, writing it, making sure you have a pattern, working with your healthcare provider, because some people don't have any effect at all and others have a really pronounced effect. So it, it, it really just depends. Um, but I think, yeah, may may point it out all the rest. I think that that was a helpful statement that you made too, with just understanding you know, how Omnipod 5 works is that, you know, it understands what your total daily insulin use is. That's how the algorithm adapts over time. Um, but it doesn't learn in the way of, you know, on Saturdays you work out or, you know, um, every 28 days, like that's when your menstrual cycle begins. So it doesn't, it doesn't know you in that personal way. Like we would all probably hope it, it would eventually, but, um, it, you know, it's going off of what your total daily insulin is. So, um, I think that was great that you mentioned that. So I'm curious if you have any Omnipod 5 specific considerations, um, for use during menstruation and, and how in your experience, you've seen it being able to manage glucose fluctuations. Um, may, may I'll start with you. So the Omnipod 5 system learns what your insulin needs are. And with each pot change, it will update its adaptive basal rate based on your total daily insulin dose over the last few pods. And so if your glucose level has been slowly creeping up leading up to your menstruation, at the next pot change, the adaptive basal rate will increase to deliver more insulin in, adjust, in addition to adjusting every five minutes based on the CGM value and also the CGM trend to mitigate the hyperglycemia. The user may also need to give more corrections more often if they tend to be hyperglycemic around this time. Yeah, that's a great point that you bring up about um, bolusing with the CGM value and trend. So something that's unique with the Omnipod 5 bolus calculator is that, you know, when you go to deliver your boluses, um, not only is it gonna deliver based on the carbs that you're inputting and your CGM value, but it's also looking at the trend or the prediction of where your glucose is heading. So um, especially during this time when you might be a little bit insulin resistant, you know, if it sees that your trend is rising at the time of the meal, it's going to, um, it can increase the suggested bolus by up to 30% based on that CGM trend. Um, so I think that's a great that's a great point to just remind people of um, that's unique with Omnipod 5. So, um, but you know, it's, you still may need some adjustments in that short-term period with 
like you said, your sensitivity factor, um, or we call it your correction factor, your carb ratio, your insulin time. So, um, and then Dr. Thorsell, what about your experience? Um, have you had a similar? Yeah, so I just wanted to add as well. So the Omnipod 5, you know, because it's adjusting insulin needs and adapting to your insulin requirements from the total daily insulin, it's actually from like the, the four to five pods from the previous two weeks. And so that might be a period when you're more insulin resistant. And sometimes if you were to change your pod right at the time of menstruation, when your insulin requirements tend to be lower, you're more um, insulin sensitive then that risk of hypoglycemia might be higher. So in this scenario, I might suggest that when you have those days of hypoglycemia at the start of your period, you may wanna transition um, to even activity mode. So it's not going to be as aggressive in giving you correction doses. Um, it just tries to keep you at a little bit higher glucose value at around 150. Um, or even you know, during that time, you might wanna increase carbohydrates and some some patients, you know, like that opportunity and that freedom mm -hmm. to, okay, I can go eat a little bit more. I can eat my bowl of cereal or I can have, you know, that muffin or whatever it is during that time. And so it's almost like a treat for them. Um, <laughs> take so, advantage of it if you can, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's, you know, because it doesn't know that insulin resistance and that, you know, the hormonal changes can come about, you know, usually you do have to, you know, eat extra carbs or just, and if it's, if it's becoming, you know, an issue where even activity mode is, is causing the hypoglycemia, then I would just suggest going into manual mode and doing a temporary basal for a short period. Yeah, that's, it, it's a great point about, you know, how the system adapts and that, you know, it's, it adapts based on like your total daily insulin and, you know, it's looking at all of the insulin delivery history, but, you know, it's looking those last four to five pods um, really make the most impact. Um, I kind of think about it like an A1C. So, you know, an A1C looks at the last three months, but it's the last month that's kind of weighted more heavily. And so with Omnipod 5, it's looking at all the pods and all the insulin history, but those last four to five kind of have the biggest um, impact in how it determines the adaptive basal rate. And, and again, it's all individualized. So, you know, just um, looking at your patterns and working with your healthcare provider and, um, you know, the more you know about your body and how it reacts in these situations, the more equipped you're gonna be to troubleshoot and find the strategy that works best for you. Um, great, so we're gonna move to acute steroid use. So we know that acute steroid use for illness or injury um, causes, you know, incre increased insulin resistance. It can um, kind of wreak havoc on your blood sugars uh, and you need increased doses of insulin quite dramatically. So, um, you know, thinking about Omnipod 5 and if you would have to go on to steroids, um, you could think about remaining in automated mode and maybe you intensify bolus settings. And correcting more often, or maybe you do need to revert to manual mode um, to increase basal rate settings and use temporary basals. Um, again, this is something that's individualized, but I'm curious, uh, Dr. Thorsall, I'll start with you. How is acute steroid use with patients using automated insulin delivery systems typically managed in your practice? Is it individualized or is there like a typical protocol that you follow? Yeah. So like with the previous topics, again, this is all individualized. Um, you know, your insulin requirements and the insulin resistance that you experience during steroid treatment, they're really difficult to estimate. And the research that's out there, you know, it shows that your insulin requirements might increase from 30 or even up to 100 and some people even 150 percent more during those periods. And so it really depends on you know, the type, the dose, the duration of the steroid, also your body size and your typical insulin sensitivity. Um, it depends on whether you're an inpatient versus an outpatient, but so there's so many different variables like with everything. And so, you know, a safe starting point that I usually use is, you know, increasing, you know, possibly going to manual mode and increasing the basal rates <clears throat> with the start of the steroids. And then depending on their glucose levels or their prior response, they may need to intensify um, their carb ratio and correction factor as well to kind of compensate for that insulin resistance. But um, 
yeah, individualized approach. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, short period of manual mode for maybe less than one week, if they're on prednisone or methylprednisolone, solumedrol, hydrocortisone, but if it's, you know, an intermittent or a recurrent use, like in, you know, in the setting of like an asthma flare up or lupus flare up, um, they may need to have a like steroid pattern set and it may have intensified carbohydrate ratios, intensified correction factors. Um, you might even allow for a higher rate of insulin delivery. Um, you know, a lot of times like there's a max of insulin it's delivery that you put on to, yeah, yeah, a max of okay. basal insulin. And so that might need to be increased to allow the automated insulin delivery system even to compensate for that. But mm-hmm. for chronic steroid use, um, like if you have adrenal insufficiency or interstitial lung disease or asthma where you require daily steroid use, then usually in those scenarios, I do recommend using automated mode with these, um, with the OP5 and just provide, you know, check in with your healthcare provider, frequent monitoring, review your glucose trends um, frequently during that time to optimize your carb ratio correction factor and make changes if necessary. Mm-hmm. And one thing, I'm glad you mentioned it because it, it is like an FAQ that we've gotten from patients and healthcare providers. And I see it in the chat too, that if you're in automated mode and you adjust the max basal rate, that does not have any impact on the algorithm. Um, if you're in manual mode and you adjust that max basal, it's really just, you know, that ceiling of if you were to change the basal rate, like it, it's going to say, okay, well, you can't because your max is set at this. You can't, you know, your max is set at three units an hour and you're trying to set it to five. We can't, you can't change your basal rate to be that high. But I just wanted to point out that if you were in automated mode and you change that max basal rate, it's not going to impact the algorithm at all. Um, really the, the main thing that's going to impact the algorithm is your target glucose. So, and changing your basal rates, um, in automated mode is not going to impact that adaptive basal rate either, because it's all going off of your total daily insulin. So, Mm -hmm. um, great. So let's move to illness and surgery. So we know getting sick when you have diabetes, it can add another layer of complexity with day-to-day management. And some patients can experience hyperglycemia when their body is trying to fight off an infection or an illness. Um, But then, you know, if you get a GI bug or something that causes nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, sometimes that can lead to hypoglycemia because you're not able to eat as many carbs as you typically are, or you're not able to eat at all for a period of time. Um, So I'm curious to hear some management techniques when using an automated system during these times, Um, and also it just in the case of preparing for surgery. So for example, you know, do you talk about using activity feature to reduce insulin delivery for a certain period of time when maybe a patient's not going to be eating? Um, So May, May, I'll start with you. Yeah, so during an illness, I would suggest keeping auto mode on because the system can adjust the insulin delivered based on your glucose level, and it can increase your insulin delivery if your glucose is high, or decrease or suspend insulin if your glucose is low. So it takes a lot of the work out of yourself or the user when you're not feeling good. And even if you're not eating, your body still needs insulin, Mm -hmm. which the pump will deliver as needed. It's also important to keep well hydrated and to check for ketones during illness. If your ketones are positive and glucose is within the normal range, I would suggest taking a small amount of carbs along with a bolus of insulin to lower those ketone levels. And generally, people do run high on their glucose levels when they're sick, and so you might just need to give corrections every few hours. Um, For surgery, I do recommend keeping auto mode on. Um, As long as your basal rates are within range, it should adjust your insulin for you so that even if you're, you have to be NPO um, fasting before the surgery, it would be able to suspend the insulin if you need it. But if not, then it will deliver the insulin as, as long as your body needs it. Mm-hmm. Do you ever, um, have you ever had to try like adjusting the target? You know, let's say that you have somebody on Omnipod 5 and because we have an adjustable target from 110 to 150, you know, let's say they usually are at a 110 target, but 
you know, they're sick and they're a little bit nervous, they want to stay in automated mode, is that maybe a time where you would say, you know, well, let's, we can adjust your target to let's say 120 or 130 so that we can stay in automated mode, but maybe we give you a little bit more of a buffer. Yeah, so again, it depends on whether they have that glucose rise and that insulin resistance during sickness. So mm -hmm. if, if they're running hyperglycemic anyway, I wouldn't suggest increasing their target. I'll just maximize it at 110. But absolutely, I mean, if they're running low for whatever reason, then they could increase their target to minimize the hypoglycemia. Okay, great. Um, what about you, Dr. Thorsell? Yeah, so I, I usually also recommend maintaining auto mode during illness, just like with steroid um, steroid use, you know, the cortisol that's released during the period of illness and during that stress often necessitates an increase in insulin because of their insulin resistance that they experience. And that's even when you're not eating. So most importantly, I just encourage patients to frequently monitor their glucose and their ketone levels, give additional correction if the algorithm is ineffective in reducing their glucose levels. And that's especially in the case of if their ketone levels are high and just being in close communication with your, with your healthcare provider. Um, you know, if you have a GI bug or food poisoning, you know, stomach flu, if you have high ketones, which you'll, you'll probably have anyways, cause you're not eating, but if they're very large, you know, sometimes we can mitigate that um, as an outpatient, just by having them eat something and, and taking some insulin. But in the case of vomiting or diarrhea, when you're dehydrated, that might not be a feasible option. And, you know, talking with your healthcare provider, determining when and if you need to go into the, the emergency room for IV fluids and glucose um, might be necessary. Um, also for preparing for um, surgical procedures, um, I also encourage patients to utilize the auto mode and they could either change their target glucose level to a higher level or just utilize the activity feature if it's a short, um, a short procedure in order to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia while they're not eating. And, you know, I usually err on the side of caution and would rather have their blood sugars be on the higher end going into it um, just because they can give some correction doses to bring it down, but not necessarily take glucose in to bring their blood sugar up. So um, yeah. you know, maintaining a higher blood sugar for, you know, that short period of time is not going to cause, you know, risk of long-term complications. So that mm -hmm. short surgery in the grand scheme of things, um, it's okay to keep your blood sugars a little bit high as long as you're not ketotic. Yeah. So it sounds like starting off with like that activity mode or activity feature where it's changing your target to 150 and reducing your automated insulin delivery, you know, is a, yeah. is, a, is a better start to be conservative. And, you know, if it is too much and your blood sugars are going really high, you could, you know, turn off activity feature and you can just adjust yeah. your target. So that way, you're not doing it too cold of changing your right. target and reducing. So, um, okay, great. So we're gonna move into some chronic situations, um, one of those being puberty. So um, puberty is another you know, hormonal change that can affect glycemia um, and can make diabetes management more challenging because of insulin resistance and pretty dramatic increases in insulin needs. Um, I'm sure Mamie can attest to seeing this in clinic uh, with pediatrics. So we talked about with Omnipod 5 that, you know, the system is adjusting insulin delivery every five minutes um, via microboluses based on what the user's sensor glucose value is and then what it's predicted to be 60 minutes into the future. And it's working to drive that user to what their customized target is between 110 to 150. So if the user is predicted to be above their target, it's going to increase insulin delivery through a series of microboluses every five minutes to help correct that hyperglycemia. And then in addition, you know, it's delivering that baseline automated insulin delivery, which we call our adaptive basal rate. And over time, it's looking at what your insulin delivery history is and adapting that adaptive basal rate or it's changing it based on what your total daily insulin needs are. So if in the case of puberty, it sees that the user is steadily having increasing needs in their insulin, it's gonna change that adaptive basal rate accordingly, um, which can be helpful in the case of puberty, in addition to that every five minutes adjustment that it's doing. 
Um, so, you know, this kind of alleviates the need for you to have to worry about adjusting basal rates like you may have to on a traditional pump um, because it's kind of doing that for you with the adaptivity. Um, so I'm curious, may may you know, every strat every system uses a different strategy with automating. That's just kind of how OmniPod 5 does it. But um, how do you kind of keep these different strategies and differences in mind when you're managing, you know, pubescent adolescents? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so during puberty, patients tend to be more insulin resistant and will most likely need to increase their basal rates and also strengthen their carb ratios and correction factors. Um, so like Ashley was saying earlier, um, they, they might need to decrease their carb ratios and also decrease the correction factors so that more insulin will be given. Um, also, another thing that you could do is to lower the insulin on board time and also the target glucose. For those insulin pumps where the user can adjust basal rates in closed loop or auto mode, the basal rate will probably need to be increased as well. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Omnipod 5, where if you're using it in automated mode, you know, if you adjust those basal rates, it's not having a direct impact on the algorithm because it's it's the target glucose since the system is adjusting the adaptive basal rate automatically on its own as it reviews, you know, what your TDI is at each pod change. Um, is that a situation where you may still tweak basal rates so that if they do go into manual mode, let's say, you know, they run out of sensors um, or you're seeing them in clinic and you're like, wow, you know, these basal rates are a little old now, now that we've gone through this growth spurt and we've gone through puberty, like, do you kind of look at it, adjusting it then? Yeah, you could, but then again, you know, it just depends so much and the basal rates change with every pot change. And so it's a little bit difficult to track, but definitely like if their, their total daily basal that you can see on Gluco has been way, way um, higher then what their program basal rates is, then you could uh, change their basal rates and update it in okay. case it ever goes into man manual mode for whatever reason. Great. Um, okay, so then moving towards um, another chronic scenario is you know, perimenopause and menopause and postmenopause. So we know that hormonal changes um, at puberty affect glycemia, but I, I'm also curious about you know, how perimenopause and menopause can affect it. So Dr. Thorsell, what are some of the impacts on glycemia and insulin needs during perimenopause um, and menopause that, that you would see with your patients? Yeah, so just like puberty and the monthly menstrual cycles, fluctuating estrogen, progesterone, hormone levels during perimenopause and menopause really wreak havoc on glucose levels, insulin requirements. And that's because of, you know, the estrogen, um, tending to uh, inc increase insulin sensitivity and lower glucose levels and the progesterone um, raising blood sugar and causing insulin resistance. So those two hormones are definitely influential in influencing insulin sensitivity and requirements. And so perimenopause is anywhere from like 40, age 45 to 55, and everyone's goes into menopause at, you know, a different time. A lot of it has to do with genetic factors, but average age is around 51. Um, and then after menopause, um, once menopause is reached, when they haven't had a period for a year, their insulin requirements tend to decrease. Their glycemic stability is predicted at that point. So the best advice is expect the unexpected, be prepared to have some glycemic variability during this transition. Um, you know, this is more of a chronic condition. So I definitely encourage automated mode for it to kind of adapt to your, your blood sugar levels and um, automate the insulin delivery based on your sensor glucose. But eating a healthy diet, maintaining regular exercise to mitigate this insulin resistance part of it is necessary. Um, but every woman's experience is very unique. So utilizing continuous glucose monitoring, frequent follow-up and checking in with your healthcare provider to make modifications in your insulin therapy to make the transition as seamless as possible is, is, is necessary. And, you know, a, adjusting your correction factor, adjusting your sensitivity factor, um, target glucose can all help the algorithm to be more aggressive in, in reducing your blood sugars if you're having that insulin resistance. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, that was going to be my next question, you know, is like, well, how specifically could an automated insulin delivery system, in addition to, you know, different um, healthy eating habits and exercise, how could those, how could an AID system be helpful with managing these fluctuations? And um, I think you kind of just hit the nail on the head there that because it's able to compensate and adjust background insulin delivery accordingly, um, you know, those are just little micromanaging things that yeah. if you're doing it on your own with the standard pump, it's, it can be a lot more tricky and frustrating. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I think that's really the most important is just that the, the system has an algorithm to adapt to your, you know, insulin requirements and it's adjusting basal delivery to compensate for these prolonged periods of high blood sugar that occur during this perimenopausal period. And so, you know, whether, depending on what type of automated insulin delivery system you have, it may give additional correction boluses or automate the delivery with these micro boluses every five minutes to compensate for this hyperglycemia during the insulin resistant state, which oftentimes is, is seen as postprandial hyperglycemia and increased insulin requirements overall, but. Okay. Great. Well, very interesting. Um, okay. So I see we have about seven minutes left. So um, I'd love to ask this final question to both of you. Um, so overall, you know, how have the technology advancements that you've seen, you know, helped patients and providers as they encounter these various lifestyle um, or life cycle, I should say, changes? Um, it, you know, it's probably so much different than it was five years ago with diabetes care now that we have these different tools in our toolbox. So May, May, I'll start with you. Yeah, you know, over the past few years, the technology for diabetes care has really advanced uh, to relieve a lot of the burden for diabetes care, like continuous glucose monitors that don't require daily finger pricks for calibrations, automated insulin delivery pumps that can adjust the amount of insulin delivered to help mitigate the glucose highs and lows. And, um, and these AID pumps can also adjust their algorithms with the patient's insulin needs and patterns over time. So it ad adapts to whatever life stage the person is in. Mm -hmm. Dr. Thorsa, what about you? Yeah, so personally, I can say, you know, the advent of continuous glucose monitoring and automated insulin delivery systems have certainly made living with diabetes easy. I've been living with it for over 20 years, 22 years now, and, you know, I've kind of seeing the, the, the development of these systems and how it makes living with diabetes much easier, the, the AID systems, especially, um, you know, helping patients as well with lowering the A1C, increasing their time and range. There's a lot less glucose variability and most importantly, a lot less nocturnal hypoglycemia, which was mm -hmm. huge for me. Um, you know, that's, that was my biggest struggle was having low blood sugars overnight and being on these systems now, I, have, I don't have any low blood sugars overnight. You know, the daytime variability um, certainly is going to happen with like incorrect carb counting or, you know, other factors, you know, periods, exercise, food consumed, um, you know, that is going to lead to some variability, but these systems are adaptive and giving you that extra insulin that you need to mitigate the hyperglycemia. So overall, I think they they take one more thing out of the very, you know, your mind, you know, it just allows you to focus more on living a healthy life, less distress on managing your diabetes. Um, and, and the, the additional thing that I have found as a healthcare provider and an endocrinologist is that it's allowed remote monitoring feasible. So mm -hmm. we can efficiently respond to any kind of urgent glycemic concerns without having the patient come in to the office. We can review your sensor glucose patterns remotely we can effectively adjust your insulin delivery settings if it's necessary. And I really noticed this most pronounced during the COVID pandemic, obviously, when we were, you know, doing all telemedicine and, you know, really our, our practice continued the same because of these systems allowing for remote monitoring, we could access patient data. And, you know, that really also justified compliance for the patients as well, that they're, that they're doing as they're, um, you know, as, as we discussed and, and then we can effectively make treatment decisions. So mm -hmm. but it, that yeah. has been a huge impact for, for industry, for healthcare providers. Yeah, I totally agree with that because, I mean, mm -hmm. looking at people's downloads tells me 
everything about their patterns. How often mm -hmm. do they change their infusion sets or their pods? Do they actually pre-bolus? Um, and are they adjusting their, their bolus amounts or are they following their bolus calculator? I can see all those things and I can adjust my treatment um, accordingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and using Omnipod 5, you know, we, we kind of thought about this as we were developing and, you know, we really wanted to make sure we know how essential data is. And so with Omnipod 5, it's cloud to cloud. And as long as you are connected to, um, you know, as long as you en enroll in Gluco and you um, have that ProConnect code for your clinic, they can see all of your data in Gluco remotely and you don't have to plug anything in at home or, um, you know, try to work hard just to get your data to your doctor. It all goes seamlessly. So, um, I, I'm glad to hear that that you guys really appreciate the data because that we know how important it is with our users and with healthcare providers. So that was important with us for Omnipod 5. Um, I know we we'll only have two more minutes. So I, I want to open it up, Katie, if there are any burning questions out there. Yes, there are quite a few. I just... <clears throat> Before we jump into that, I just want to say thank you to Bethany, Ashley, and Maymay um, just for these incredible answers and guidance in these really tricky situations. Um, it's just, it's so nice to hear kind of real world application on how the system can accommodate that. So thank you so much for your insight and your expertise. It's just incredibly helpful uh, for us, the end user. So thank you. Um, one of the big questions was the, um, and it's, Okay, if there if if you guys don't know the answer to this, but one of the questions was talking about the max basal rate and how that relates to the algorithm. And um, for example, uh, this individual who's asking the question said the max basal rate. Um, his son, I'm, let me back up. His son is very active and is uh, effectively is a, a marathoner during the week and a couch potato on the weekend. Mm -hmm. And they're routinely adjusting the max basal to compensate for the automated mode overcorrecting for highs uh, during the weekdays or undercorrecting then for the highs on the weekends. And but if they don't if they don't do this and the max basal ceiling is hit for too long, the system shuts off. Um, so do you have any insight for that um, for Troy, just as he's trying to navigate this with his son? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, um, go ahead, Mamie. Um, no, you can, yeah, you can go first. Um, yeah, the, the max basal is, is not going to have any impact on the algorithm. So changing that max basal, um, I'm sure it's frustrating um, and confusing because you, you may feel like it's doing something and other days it might not, but it, I, I assure you, um, you know, and this is referenced in our user guide that the max basal has no impact whatsoever on the algorithm. It's it's the target glucose that's directly impacting it, as well as the total daily insulin use. Um, and for the comment regarding, you know, hitting um, the automated delivery restriction, um, if they're getting that because they're hitting that max um, maximum insulin delivery, that's really a safety feature with the pump. So you know, if they're hitting that, it's because the system was delivering at the maximum amount that it could give um, for a certain period of time. And it's saying, hold on a second, check your glucose, you know, check your pump site, make sure that, you know, all of that is working and maybe do a finger stick because we've been delivering at the max amount. And so we're going to have you go into manual mode so you can troubleshoot to make sure that we don't just keep delivering the max amount when, you know, in fact, your site is not working or your blood sugar is not coming down. So um, in that case, if, if that's happening often, you know, it sounds like maybe working with the healthcare provider to look at patterns like they were, like we were talking about looking at gluco, um, seeing when are you hitting that max bullet or that automated max delivery. Um, do we need to think about intensifying carb ratios, correction factors? Um, the duration of insulin action, you know, rather than modifying that max delivery or that max basal when it's not impacting the algorithm. So, yeah, yeah I can attest to that. As, 
as well. I, I made the comment about the adjusting the max delivery um, in the in situations where you're on steroids and your insulin resistance is increased. And that was mainly intended for you may need to increase your max delivery and adjust and go into manual mode and just make sure that, you know, you might have had a max delivery at three, but maybe you need to go up to five or something like that. Um, really, that has nothing to do with the algorithm, but, you know, I usually will intensify their carb ratios, intensify their correction factors, change their target glucose um, so that it will allow more insulin to be, to be given and reduce that hyperglycemia. Mm -hmm. Well, those are great answers. Thank you. Um, we have time just for one more quick question. And um, when will the Omnipod uh, 5 be available to use with a Dexcom 7? <laughs> that's, that's the, <laughs> the million dollar question. <laughs> the million dollar question. Um, we don't have any, any sort of timeline that that we've disclosed. So unfortunately, you know, I don't, I don't have that information. Um, we have said that we're working on it, but other than that, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball to say when that will be, but, but we, we know it's, we know it's, uh, it's, a uh, it's something that users want and we're definitely listening to that. So thank you, Bethany. Uh, well, we are out of time. Again, I just want to thank Bethany, Dr. Thorsell, and May May for your expertise. Um, I will send out a follow-up email tomorrow with the link of the recording once it's available. If you have any follow-up questions, you can um, email info at sansum.org, S-A-N-S-U-M.org. I'll also put that email out and I can forward it on to the Insulet team to get your questions answered. But thank you for your time and your expertise. And this is just wonderful. I'm just so appreciative of um, you guys being here today. Yeah, thank you so much thank for the invitation. Yeah, thank you for letting us. Thank you, and Dr. Thorsell. It was great. Thanks to the audience. Um, thank you. Have a good evening. All right, goodbye, everybody. Bye.